Thank you very much for this kind introduction. It's great being here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, as you certainly know, throughout the 20th century, the resolution of any light-focusing microscope and also fluorescence micro microscopy was fundamentally limited by diffraction to about 200 nanometers. And the best picture that one could get with focused visible light uh, in biological imaging was by confocal microscopy. But confocal microscopy was also diffraction limited. Now, the turn of the century witnessed the breaking of the diffraction barrier, meaning that uh, microscopy concepts came up that uh, allowed us giving much better resolution. And the first concept of this kind was that microscopy, as you just heard, and this picture that you can see um, <clears throat> shows you that um, uh, STAT microscope attained a much higher spatial resolution, or is capable of attaining much higher spatial resolution than a confocal microscope or a standard epifluorescence microscope, in this case by a factor of 10. Now, um, this um, achievement showing that there is physics, so to speak, in this world that allows you to get much sharper picture than what people have believed for, for a century or more, has actually led uh, to the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Um, in 2014, and um, actually the, the stat picture is taken from um, the poster, or the official poster of the Nobel Foundation for the uh, 2014 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and this poster shows actually um, a sketch of the stat microscope, so the method uh, which I have uh, um, developed with my collaborators and um, also another method, which uh, is called palm or storm microscopy, which shares some fundamental principles, but works in a different way in very important aspects, and which also became very popular, very, very powerful. Now, um, I will talk briefly about STAT microscopy, which um, uh, has um, uh, the capability of basically operating with any floor for be it um, uh, organic flow for GFP or even a quantum dot, and it operates by um, uh, using a, a beam that turns molecules on, so a fluorescence excitation beam and a beam that turns molecules off, which is shown here in this sketch of the Nobel Foundation in red. And that red beam is donut-shaped, and by turning molecules off at the outer part of a focal spot, uh, we get the signal just from those molecules at the inner part of the focal spot, and in this way, uh, by raster scanning the, those pairs of beams across the specimen, we get much sharper images. Now, uh, at the time the principles of this microscope were demonstrated, that was 1999-2000, um, STAT microscopy looked like this. I mean, this is a picture of, um, uh, of a laboratory stage, early stage STAT microscope showing one of my PhD students at that time. Um, uh, and of course, if you don't know how well it works, if you still have to do research on the principles, you don't know um, what you have to leave out in order to make it viable. By now, we have understood it very well. And so um, uh, a modern STAT microscope really fits into a box that is of the size of a shoe box, really like this. So this is, uh, contains all the, the beams, uh, forming elements, and so on, and the scanners, and can be attached to any epifluorescence microscope. So it, in essence, it's possible to convert any epifluorescence microscope, no, no matter which manufacturer, basically within three minutes into a super resolution stat microscope that works push button. And um, uh, the good thing is it works, you can do that for 220K monetary units, be dollars, euros, pounds, I don't know what um, uh, you can choose. Um, and so what I'm saying by this is that um, the time where, say, Super resolution or stat microscopy in particular was kind of complicated, difficult to use, is absolutely over, and now it's a push button technique that can be readily applied. As a matter of fact, stat microscopy has been applied and is being applied as we speak to all kinds of um, the investigations in cell biology. Um, I'm showing a picture from a very recent review that was um, actually published just a few months ago. And it kind of shows a sketch of the cell. And as you can see, of course, um, uh, the areas, um, uh, say, so where uh, it, uh, it was applied to, um, to the cytoskeleton, mitochondria, um, Golgi apparatus, and so on. 
both in fixed cells and in living cells. There are some compromises uh, that you have to take at present when you apply it to living cells, but it also works for, uh, for imaging living cells. And um, another um, view graph here shows uh, the application range in the neurosciences in particular, um, where it has been also applied to the imaging of neurons um, in vivo, to the, to the molecular layer, to the upper layer of, of living mice. And this is shown actually in this, in this uh, uh, nice uh, little um, <clears throat> panel on the right, the bottom, showing actually um, the um, uh, dendritic uh, stretch, uh, uh, stretch of, a dendri uh, of a dendrite with spines and so on. And in movie, you can see them even, even move. Now, um, I'm not going to talk much about stat microscopy, although that's clearly something that, that was very close to my heart and still is very close to my heart for many, many years. Um, I will um, talk a bit about um, more recent developments and my motivation for this. Now, as I said, um, the two, I would say, cornerstones of super resolution fluorescence microscopy, stat microscopy, and, and palm or store microscopy, have many similarities, there's differences as well, but one similarity there is for sure. In principle, both methods, at a time of conception, it was, that was clear right from, from the outset, both methods can in principle attain a spatial resolution that is at the size of a molecule, of one nanometer. So in principle. But in practice, um, in practice they don't. So, um, in practice, the gain of spatial resolution is largely by a factor of three, four, five, ten or so, um, and only in very, under very rare circumstances you get a much higher spatial resolution, say, of uh, below 10 nanometers. Uh, there are special variants uh, of, um, of stat microscopy applications where you can get a single digit nanometer um, uh, resolution, but you need a special floor force for, for that. And the same applies um, to, to palm or storm. With, under special conditions, in special uh, variations, you get down to a, to a few nanometers, but not as a general rule. And um, when I started out uh, looking into this problem many years back in the, in the early 90s, of course my dream was to get down to a spatial resolution that is really at the size um, of a nanometer. And so at the time the Nobel Prize was given, that was clear that in principle, you can achieve a spatial resolution of, a, of, a, of the size of a molecule, a nanometer, but, but, but not in practice. So the Nobel Foundation actually put it quite correctly. The microscopes really crossed the threshold, but did not attain the ultimate limit. So this is what I put it here. And so um, after um, having had the honor of sharing uh, uh, the Nobel Prize, I thought, okay, now I have to deliver, and I'm going to show that there is, there is indeed a way to get down to one nanometer spatial resolution. So in essence, I'm going to kind of, well, change the title of my talk, so I'm, so I'm giving, I'm calling it actually um, Farfield Fluorescence Nanoscopy or Super Resolution Microscopy Post Nobel. And um, the subtitle is MinFlux, that's a new concept, attaining molecular size one nanometer resolution. Now in order to explain to you how we can now attain this a resolution that is that high, I have to get you on the same page as far as uh, understanding the basic principles of super resolution or fluorescence microscopy or nanoscopy is concerned. And in order to do that, I'm coming back to the very basics. Now, what is actually the reason why the resolution of light microscopy in the 20th century was limited by diffraction. Or why did people believe that resolution of a light microscope is fundamentally limited by diffraction? The answer is very simple. Because they thought, and that was a misconception, that a separation of features in a light-focusing microscope has to be done by the phenomenon of focusing the light. So in other words, if you manage to focus the light very, very sharply down to a small spot, then of course you get a high spatial resolution because you can concentrate that sharp spot of light to a very tiny area, as it is shown here in, um, in, in, um, <clears throat> on the slide. And so um, the same applies, by the way, if you have um, epifluorescence imaging, so if you image uh, the, the sample in white field, each feature, of course, will produce um, uh, light 
that cannot be focused down to a point. So also here in the detection plane, of course, we get a blob of light that is limited by diffraction. And um, again, you're also on the detector side limited by diffraction, meaning that if you have features coming closer than what is given by Abbe's equation, wavelengths divided by twice the numerical aperture with objective lens, you cannot tell the features apart because either the, the features will be flooded at the same time with light, um, producing signal that is confused, or, and it's the same thing, in the back focal plane, uh, the, the diffraction signal, the, the diffracted signal of each of the features will, will overlap in space and no detector will be able to tell um, these features apart. So the problem was, and I think this is a very, very important insight, um, the problem was that people thought that you have to separate by focusing. But if you give this up, this notion, if you say, okay, we don't want to separate by focusing, we separate in a different way, we can overcome the diffraction barrier. So the actual discovery that has really led to the to uh, modern super resolution techniques and to, to very high spatial resolution was the, the, the idea to give up the phenomenon, to give up the phenomenon of focusing for the purpose of separation. So modern super resolution microscopes, whatever they are called, stat, palm, storm, paint, whatever, in the end, or at the end of the day, they separate features by molecular states. And once you separate features by molecular states, the focusing doesn't really matter because the separation is not done by the focusing anymore. So what does that mean? If you have now several features falling within this green spot of excitation light that you see on the right, um, if you manage to keep some of the molecules in a different state, the simplest case in a state in which is not capable of emitting fluorescent light, then, of course, you can separate the emitting fluorophores, so the one in the center, the yellow ones, from the dark ones, the black ones, because those cannot emit light. And so it's very clear that we can separate the feature in the center of that green spot from those at the outer part. It's very obvious, because we separate by, by um, molecular states. And so um, this has been the basic idea of STED microscopy, and this is how STED microscopy set itself apart from any other super-resolution concept that existed before. It played on and off with the dye um, in order to make the dyes distinguishable within that green diffracted spot of light. Now, stimulated emission, as you may know, just pushes molecule from the excited fluorescent state back down to the ground state, and in this way we can keep the molecules dark. So as not only we have a beam of light that turns molecules on, so pushes them from the, or excites them from the ground state to the excited state, we, but we also have a, a, we have a beam that does the opposite, turns them off. And so by turning them off um, at the outer part of the spot by using this uh, uh, say redshift the donut shaped beam, we can um, produce two classes of molecules, molecules that are in yon state emitting light and molecules that are in the off state. And then of course, we go to the next one and we do with the next one and so on so we can um, get each of the molecules uh, or features emitting um, by transiently turning them on and off. Now a hallmark of that microscopy is that, as I said, we use a donut beam that has a zero at the center, a zero intensity point at the center to leave an area where the molecules are allowed to assume the on state and in the rest of, um, of the focal area they have to be off. And for that reason, we always know where the signal comes from. Um, we can say that we target, actually, the coordinate in which the molecules are allowed to be on. So we always know the X, Y, Z coordinate where molecules are on. And as we scan, of course, um, that say, donut shaped beam across the focal region, we always know where the signal comes from. We don't have to find it out. We know it because that donut beam critically determines where the molecules are on and where the molecules are off, as I'm showing this viewgraph. You see, as we scan the donut across that, um, uh, say, green excitation area, we, we, target different, we target different features, but we always know where the features are located because we control the position of that donut with very high precision using a galvanometer scanner or whatever, or a stage and, and so on. So we can control the position very, very um, precisely. Now, um, it's, um, so STAT 
uses the most fundamental way of turning a fluorophore off that stimulate emission. So if you, if you want to turn off any fluorophore by a certain, say, for the physical uh, means, uh, the most general way of doing it is stimulate emission. But of course, there are also other states, um, dark states, and, and, um, that you can use in order to transiently turn a molecule off. And, and um, they have been described in the literature. You can push molecules to a long-lived dark state, such as a triplet state or so electron transfer or, or whatever. You can have a cis-trans isomerization. For example, then say the, uh, the cis form uh, is capable of emitting light. For example, the cis form is a fluorophore, but the trans form is not, so it doesn't emit light if you put excitation light on it, and so on. As long as you have at least two separable states, you can use these states in order to make the molecules distinguishable. And because the separation is done by states, but not by the focusing of light, you can break the diffraction barrier. But as I said, you also need a coordinate, and that is done in stat microscopy and related techniques just by, by having this, uh, say, whatever donut-shaped um, type of beam. Now, um, palm storm. So how does palm storm relate uh, with this technique? Now, palm storm also uses on-off for separation. So that's the same principle. Um, but the on-off um, separation is implemented in a different way. Rather than using a, a donut or any other type of pattern of light to determine where the molecule is on and where the molecule is off, um, in the palm storm concept, um, the molecules of features are turned on and off individually on a so-called single molecule um, basis. And so you see, so in that feature, only one molecule is turned on. And then you can separate that feature from the other feature because the molecule of that feature is emitting, but, but the other features or the molecules of the other features are not. And then you turn the next one on and the next one. And in this way, you can, um, you can separate the features because only one molecule within that green diffraction area of excitation light is emitting. Now, if that happens randomly and, and stochastically, so to speak, uncontrolled, um, one has to find out where the molecule is located. It's unlike that, where that position is already determined. So you have to find it out. And that works in the palm storm concept by making sure that in the on state, there are many photons emissions. So it has to be an on state, which leads to many photon emissions, like um, if you use a cis um, um pair of states. Then, of course, if the molecule in the on state emits, um, say, uh, hundreds or so of photons, then it will produce a diffraction blob on the camera, as it is shown here on the left. Then it's possible to anticipate or to calculate, so to speak, the position of the molecule by, by calculating the centroid, because the centroid or the, the anticipated maximum of emission um, must um, coincide with um, uh, the position of the molecule, of course, um, uh, if you, if you back project it into the, into, the, into the object plane. And this has been known for, for a long time. As a matter of fact, um, if you have many, many photons, n photons, like the more photons you have, the better it is. The better is the precision that you can, um, that you can get um, uh, of the position of the molecule. So the more photon n, you have the, um, the larger n the number of photons is, the better is the precision. So there is the calcula calculation of the centroid and hence the position. Now this is actually quite interesting um, because it becomes very obvious that there is a fundamental um, similarity and relationship between both concepts. It's very obvious um, that um, in order to define the position in space with light, with photons, so to speak, be it here at, on the camera or in the, in the um, uh, focal region with that, you need many photons. It's impossible to define a coordinate with just a single photon because if this is a diffraction barrier and you have just one photon, the photon may go here or here or here or here, but it wouldn't be possible to define a zero, a donut zero, an intensity zero with just a single photon. But the more photons you have, the better you can define, say, a donut minimum or an emission maximum or anything. So you, you always need many, many photons. So um, it's, it's clear that um, there is a similarity between both concepts. You need many photons in order to get a position. Separation is done by on and off in, in both cases. But the many photons in the stat case, the many photons that you need, they come from the laser. 
So the positioning in the stat case is done with those photons that come from the laser producing that minimum because you want to produce a, a donut minimum. Whereas in here, the many photons come from the dye. And so this is actually the difference actually. So um, as I said, the common basis is on off transition, but the positioning or the, the, the finding out the coordinate is done instead with many photons that come from the laser, whereas in palm storm it's done with many photons that come from the dye. And then, of course, once you realize this, then you wonder, okay, um, now it becomes very clear where the strengths and the weaknesses of each of the concepts are. Well, um, a clear strengths of the palm storm concept if you want to get to down to a high spatial resolution, as I said, to down to a nanometer or so, is the fact that you work with signal molecules. Because if you want to have molecular resolution in the end, it's always an advantage to already work with signal molecules because you're, you're dealing already with these small entities. But the downside of palm storm clearly is that you need many photons on the camera. So you need n photons, say 100,000, 10,000, or even more, to get a very high precision of, of the donut. But that's not easily possible because, because the photons that come from a dye are usually limited in number, maybe 100, maybe 1,000 the molecule bleaches, or it goes to a, um, a long-lived off state, or something blinks and goes on and off and, and moves away. And, and so you don't get those high numbers of photons in order to get to a high spatial resolution, usually, say, of one nanometer or so. Now, if you look at, at that, then you realize, oh, photon number, that's not a problem because there, Instead, the positioning is done with the many photons that come from the laser. But a laser has zillions of photons. There's no shortage of photons whatsoever. I mean, you can get as many photons as you want. So defining a coordinate instead is, of course, much easier than, than in Palm Storm. But as I said, the strength of Palm Storm is the fact that you work on a single molecule basis. So why not combining then the strengths of the two, say, doing the positioning so to speak, with the photons that come from the laser, but work with the sing on a single molecule basis. And if you could combine those two, of course, you can come up with a new concept. So I call it min flux for reasons that I'm going to show you in a few minutes. And that should lead, in the end, um, to a, a spatial resolution that was clearly not anticipated, I would say not perhaps not even five, six years back, um, say, of a uh, few nanometers. So I'm going to talk now about this, about this concept min flux, and um, uh, I'm going to show you um, what, um, what, is, what is possible to do so far. Now this paper was, um, or this study was published uh, quite recently, and um, um, in order to explain the basic principles of it again, um, I'm, I'm coming back again to the way people usually localize molecules. So in essence, it's a new way of localizing individual molecules, not in a conventional way with a camera. It is usually done in, in single molecule tracking or palm storm and so on, but in a, in a different way. So I'm kind of starting from scratch. And so, so I'm going to explain things now from the beginning. So in case you didn't understand something now, don't worry. Now the big opportunity to start, start anew. Now, Usually, when people localize individual molecules, what they do is they have an epifluorescence microscope, so it's a wide field illumination. That's why I'm having this, this green rectang uh, rectangle here. It shows the wide field a green excitation light, and the star in the center is um, uh, the single molecule. And what happens is uh, people have a camera, as it is shown here on the, uh, on, on the sketch, and um, that molecule produces a blob of diffraction light on the camera that is displayed on a, on a computer screen. And then, of course, um, people localize by calculating the centroid of that, um, of that diffraction blob. And depending on the number of photons that they have on that, in the diffraction blob, they get a certain uncertainty um, or a certain precision uh, that scales inversely with the square root of the number of photons in that diffraction blob. And as I said, the more photons there are in the blob, the higher will be the precision. This is the, say, conventional way of localizing molecules. And as I said, this is, of course, fundamentally limited by the number of photons that are emitted by the dye during the period of measurement. Now, if you do it like this, of course, you fully rely on the number of emissions, and there's, there's no way out. It also has some other issues <clears throat> about orientation of the molecules, but that's, that's a detail you may not be interested in. So, 
As I said, we're combining now the strengths of STAT with the strengths of using single molecules. And so how do we get now the strengths of STAT? Now, as I said, the strengths of a STAT concept and related concept is, this, is that we define a position in space with a donut beam. As a matter of fact, a donut beam is fantastic at defining positions in space. Why? Because a donut beam has a central intensity zero, and that zero can be defined with very high precision if you have enough photons coming from the laser, because as I said, the brighter the donut is, the better it is defined is the zero. So a donut zero very effectively defines a coordinate in sample space. Now imagine we don't do stimulated emission, we don't de-excite molecules or turn molecules off. We use now a green beam, and the green beam, the green donut shaped beam is now used for exciting light. So we excite molecules. Now you can imagine, if that molecule, that little yellow star, is right in the center of the donut, then, right in the center of the donut, right in the, in the donut minimum, then there won't be any excitation and no fluorescence light emitted, simply because there is no light in the center of the donut, it has an intensity zero, and then, of course, there is absence of signal. But, of course, we would know that the molecule is in, at the center of the donut, and hence we would know where the molecule is located because we control the donut position basically with arbitrary precision. And then we know exactly where the molecule is located from the absence of fluorescence emission. So if the molecule is slightly off the donut position or the donut is slightly off the molecule, doesn't matter, um, we will get signal and, um, from, um, and from the strengths of the signal we can actually infer on the position of the molecule and of course we know that the molecule is not coinciding with the donut um, zero. And so, of course, um, one can imagine coming up with a concept that kind of um, measures the position of a molecule by trying to assess the position of a molecule with a donut beam. If you are worried for some reason that, oh, that doesn't make any sense because you don't get any signal if something is in the center of it and you have to wait for ages to get something, that's not the case because we can crank up, so to speak, the, the power of the donut, it will not bleach our molecule because the molecule still is in the region where intensity is very weak and so it won't be bleached, we just get signal. So there's a way of controlling actually the signal and the measuring time without, without bleaching the molecule. And now um, I'm going to explain to you the basic idea behind this localization scheme. Now since my last name is Hell, I thought I have to come up with a little demon. And um, um, <clears throat> so that's the demon. And um, let's imagine now, since it is a demon, the demon knows exactly where the molecule is located. Or if the molecule starts moving, of course, the demon would know exactly where the molecule would go. And so that demon uh, kind of controls the position of the donut. So there's a beam deflector in here, uh, and that beam deflector um, kind of is, is operated by the demon, and the demon then pushes the donut such that the zero coincides with the position of the molecule. Now, since the demon knows exactly where the molecule will go, the demon obviously manages to always make the molecule coincide with the, with the donut zero, or, say, or in other words, the, um, the, the donut zero will always coincide with the molecule because the, the, the demon pushes the donut zero exactly to the position of the molecule. So why is this interesting, this thought experiment? It's interesting because it shows that in this way, of course, the demon could trace the position of the molecule with arbitrary precision, with arbitrary precision, nanometer precision, without requiring any single photon emission. Because the molecule is in the center of the donut, and then there is no fluorescence excitation going on there. But from the fact that there is no emission, of course, there's no signal coming, we know exactly the molecule must be in the center of, of the donut. And so we know the position of the molecule at any point in time with arbitrary precision. So what happens actually here in this hard experiment is that positioning is not done with the fluorescence photon coming out, as is done in, say, the conventional localization or in palm storm, the positioning is done, or largely done, by the photons that come from the laser, by the excitation photons. So excitation photons determine the position in space, and then, of course, you get, um, you get a well-defined coordinate, and so you do the localization, actually, by, or to a large extent, 
by um, the position, um, by, by the, the photons that come from the light source. And as I said, the resilience of them, you're not limited to the number of photons that you have. Now, of course, there's no such thing as a demon, and even I cannot make one. And, um, but what we can do is, of course, we can kind of approach the demon situation by implementing an, an electronics circuit that measures the fluorescence that is detected when the molecule is slightly off the donut position. So if the molecule is slight, slightly off the donut center, of course, it will produce some signal, and that indicates the, the actual position of the molecule, and that can be fed into a closed loop that then pushes again, um, that pushes again the, uh, the deflector, and then we know roughly where the molecule um, is located. So in essence, um, by operating a closed loop where we kind of try to catch the molecule or bring the, bring the donut very close to the, the donut center, very close to the position of the molecule, we can trace the position of the molecule with very high precision, but with very few emitted photons. So we save a lot of emitted photons. Still, we get a very high precision. Why? The majority of the, of the localization is done with the photons that come in. So they, they give us, we, we get a sort of rough positioning with the photons that go in, and we do only a fine tuning with the few fluorescence emissions that indicate how, 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 how off we are with respect to the, um, with respect to the uh, actual position of the molecule. So it's just a fine, fine tuning. And now, you will not be surprised that I decided to call it min flux. It stems from the fact that we use a minimum for, for um, de detecting actually the position of the molecule. And of course, it also requires a minimum of fluorescence emission in order to get a, the high, um, a high precision of the molecule. Okay, but um, um, how do we find out now the position? Or how do we maximize the information that we get from the signal? Well, in order to explain this to you, it's also very simple, and I'm, I'm going to show you in, 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 by, by, by ver with using very simple explanation why this is so powerful. So let's assume the molecule is in between those dots, the purple dot and um, the violet dot and the, and the yellow dot. And so the molecule is in between, and we anticipate that the molecule is somewhere on, on that line that has this length L. Now, the donut has um, a center minimum, and in first approximation, um, the zero around the minimum is a parabola, so it's a parabolic approximation. And then we get the position of the molecule simply by scanning that donut across the molecule, exciting the molecule, and then what you see in the, uh, the yellow line in the lower panel is actually the fluorescent signal. And as soon as the donut, zero, overlaps in space with the position of the molecule, fluorescence is zero. And so we would instantly know where the molecule is located from, from, uh, from the position of the zero emission. It's, it's very obvious. And this, in this way, we find out where the molecule is located if you don't know it. So that's very clear. But the point I'm making here is the following. Actually, we do not have to scan that densely across the molecule, as I'm showing here. If we know the curve, the intensity curve of of that, um, uh, of that donut, so intensity, uh, say, shape of the donut, the one shown in the, in the center panel, then it's perfectly enough to measure the endpoints of, this, of the fluorescent signal. If you know that this is a parabola, so that yellow line is a parabola because, because the donut intensity around the zero is a parabola, then we can make a simple ca um, calculation and, um, and find out the position of the maximum XM by dividing L, so that's the, the, the region over which we scan over one plus the square root of the brightness of the two endpoints. So it comes out by a seventh grade um, quadratic equation, if you solve that. And, um, and that, this is actually quite, quite um, um, illustrative, simply because the simple equation tells us there is no wavelength dependence. This is kind, if you look at it, I mean, you see the position of the molecule depends on that range L that is not wavelength dependent, and also does not depend, uh, and the denominator also doesn't contain the wavelengths. And this may, be, look, they may look strange in, in the first moment because we use focused light and, 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 and of course, um, uh, light that has a finite wavelength, but if you think about it, it's not that strange. 
because in the end, the molecule is a singularity, if you will, it's just a point, and then we check that position of that point with another point, which is the zero of that, of that intensity profile. So basically use two points, and then it doesn't really matter how the zero is created with a wavelength that is that large or a wavelength that is that large. In the end, it's all about the point, the zero intensity point, and the molecule is also a point. And this is why the wavelength doesn't really matter. And this really shows um, that this concept is very, very powerful. So in the end, the wavelength doesn't matter. Keep in mind, we use focused visible light. Now, if you do the math, you will find out that um, uh, the uncertainty there's always an uncertainty of, of defining that position, xm, will depend on the, the range L, so the range in which we, which we uh, anticipate that molecule, and it scales again inversely with the square root of the number of detected photons. So n is the number of detected photons, the sum of uh, n0 and n1. So still we have this dependence um, of the number, on the number of detected photons, one over square root of n, however, and that's the major difference. We have a handle on, on, on the problem because it also depends on that range L over which we scan, anticipating the molecule, and that range, of course, we can change. We can make that smaller because once we have a coarse anticipation where the molecule is located, we can reduce that range because we know, okay, we know it's roughly there, then we make that range smaller, and by making it smaller, of course, we make the, pre we make the precision going up. It's very simple. And of course, making something smaller in a linear way, as it is since it depends linearly on L, is much more effective than waiting for more photons to come because the, the number of photons um, is damped by this square root dependence. So it's much more effective to reduce the area than to wait for more photons because we have, in the number of photons, we have this, this square root dependence. So in other words, we can increase, of course, the precision by iteratively going down with the range um, um, where, we, where we look out for the molecule. So this is the essence of it. By the way, there's also no dependence on the, on the molecular orientation or only to a very, very high order, and so it doesn't really matter. Now in 2D, of course, you have to have more points. Three would be enough, but it's better to have four in order to avoid ambiguities. And then the equation is not that simple anymore, but um, um, it can be sorted out. You can, you can find a function that gives us the position based on the measurements of four points. So we place the donor to that red point, uh, violet point, and yellow point, and to the, um, the blue one in the, in the center, and then we find out the position of that yellow uh, molecule. And then, of course, as I said, Again, once we know roughly where it is, uh, we don't have to wait to get even more photons, more photons, more photons. We just squeeze the area in which we, which we um, uh, uh, look for the position of the molecule, and that um, uh, means that we increase the precision. So by keeping the number of detected photons the same um, and reducing the area, of course, we, we increase the precision without requiring um, uh, more, more emissions. And here, Actually, what we show here is um, how, um, how many photons you need actually to get a certain uh, localization precision. So on the bottom, you see actually a total number of detected fluorescent photons um, uh, for, for a camera. So that's the, the, uh, the two lines on the top for a, a perfect camera and a realistic camera. And then for the new concept, that's the, the orange line, so um, uh, showing uh, uh, um, and a range of about 50 nanometers in which we look for the molecule. Now, um, that's, by the way, a theoretical calculation. It's not, not a fit. It's not a fit. It's a calculation. And this is the measurement. Um, and uh, it shows, actually, that the measurement nicely coincides with the theory, with the theoretical anticipation. And uh, above all, with 10 detected photons, you get a precision of 10 nanometers, which is which is not bad, of course. Um, with a camera, you need 200 um, detected photons, I'm uh, sorry, um, 290 detected photons for a single to background ratio of, of, um, of 200. And so, uh, again, why do we save fluorescence photons for localization? Because to a large extent, the localization is done with the photons that come from the laser, with the green photons, by, by defining a coordinate in space with a donut-shaped excitation beam. And again, as I said, 
um, one has this dependence on, on, the, on the scanning range or on the uh, investigation range. And once you have a coarse approximation where it is, you make that re region smaller, and then you, um, uh, you need fewer photons um, and so on. So the reduction of the investigation range outperforms the one over square root of n localization dependence. And so this is um, an example where you can really outperform this dependence on the number of emitted photons. And I think this is, this is really important because otherwise the only option is to, to wait for longer, wait longer, wait longer, and then in the end you will be limited. Now, of course, there are several ways of doing imaging now. Um, one would be um, uh, since it's single molecule based, one would be to turn on and off as it is done in storm um, or pawn. Uh, so there's no difference in that with that regard. So turn one molecule on within the investigated range, keep the rest um, um, keep the, keep the rest dark, but not localize the molecules by getting the diffraction pattern on a camera, but by scanning with an excitation donut, uh, the position of the molecule, and making actually four measurements, as is done in here. And from those four measurements, you can infer on the position of the molecule. Or you can track, again, uh, if a molecule um, uh, moves um, around in the focal region. So those um, blue, violet, um, red, and yellow points actually show the, the, the measurement points where we place our donuts. So we place those, the donuts in, in quick succession to these points, the donut zero in quick successions, and then uh, from these, um, say, four measurements, we instantly can infer on the position of the molecule. Then, of course, you can have a tracking like this, where you move those measurement points along with, uh, with the molecule. Now, um, this has led actually to demonstrations that one can um, track molecules much faster than is usually done with cameras. So this is actually um, a protein um, uh, ribosomal subunit labeled with MS EOS uh, 2, which is typically used in the single molecule uh, localization um, uh, techniques. And then, um, uh, we get about 8,000 localization per second with a precision of about, in this case, 40 nanometers uh, in a living E. coli. Um, and so there's a substantially higher speed. So it can, it can be 100 times, 200 times faster than, than, um, than is what is usually done. And I think this, this has a great deal, deal of potential uh, for for investigating movements of molecules, especially uh, of macromolecules on very small scales. Why? Because if, if you look just on single molecules, those so macromolecular entities, then you can, of course, confine the investigation range, so the L, to very small dimensions, say 10, 20 nanometers, meaning that you need only a few photons in order to get a very high spatial resolution, or only to get down to a nanometer or so. And just as a demonstration, so what we did here, is um, uh, we labeled uh, a piece of DNA with a, uh, with a fluorophore, but in this case, um, the fluorophore was kind of arrested. So with a sigma of about 2.4 nanometer, which is not bad, um, um, or for a sigma of 2.4 nanometer localization precision, we required only 400 microseconds. Okay, and as I said, the measurement was done on the four points, the four, the, the violet, the yellow, the blue, and the green point, and the cloud actually shows the, the, the distribution of localizations. The next thing we did is we moved actually, or we allowed the molecule to move, that fluorescent molecule to move by putting it on a DNA bridge. And then of course, this is seen in the distributions of localizations. You see it's now spread out. But that's not an uncertain thing. The position of each of the, of the molecules at any given instant was um, the precision of the position of, of the molecule at any given instant was very high, 2.5 uh, nanometers, and um, localized, as I said, within 400 microseconds. And so there were, in this experiment, seven times fewer photons needed than with a camera. Of course, you couldn't get that with a camera. And this has allowed us to take a sort of reconstruct a movie of the movement of the molecule. And so that's shown on the, the panel on the right. So actually, this is how the molecule moved. Um, during the measurement, and that, that gave us that distribution of localizations over, um, over time. Now, um, so I think this is, uh, there's a lot of potential for, for a kind of dynamic structure of biology, and, and I think this ha will have implications in, in various fields, including pharmacology and so on. Of course, you can also do imaging. Um, so, um, as I said, um, see, 
true molecular resolution was not attained uh, uh, with the standard flow force at the time um, the Nobel Prize was given, only with some few exceptions. Um, so um, uh, a molecular arrangement like this, where the molecules were just 11 nanometers apart, um, so this is a sketch of a specific molecular arrangement, um, could not be readily imaged. And so we have um, simulated a palm storm image um, under, say, ideal conditions. It's not experimentally simulated. Why? Because uh, we said, okay, we want to have zero background, so it's the ideal performance. Uh, otherwise, somebody would come and say, oh, but my camera is better or my turf system is better than yours. So this under ideal conditions, um, uh, perfect um, signal, no background. And this is the comparison that is experimental. So under realistic condition, measured experimental data of min flux. And clearly, because of the fact that we require fewer photons to locate our molecules, we could, um, we could resolve um, those molecules um, uh, uh, very easily with the same number of photons. And so these are other examples. Um, just to show you that um, uh, we see all kinds of patterns, of course, if we, if we try it out for, for various uh, ways of doing it. Now, I like this picture very much because um, although it's not uh, visually very arresting, um, so these molecules are only six nanometers apart. So this is about, say, these are molecular distances, if you will, and, and you see there on the screen, now imagine six nanometers, that is six nanometers, so the diffraction barrier is 250 nanometers, probably about the size of the wall here. And um, 20 years back, um, people would have said, what? You want to resolve molecules that are six nanometers apart with focused visible light, and there's no dependence on the wavelengths? Come on, you must be crazy. But um, this is reality. It is like that. We can image with at a resolution that is down to the size of a molecule and with no wavelength dependence. That's it. And don't forget, it's done with regular objective lenses with focused visible light. And the key to this achievement is not to resolve by the phenomenon of focusing, but to resolve by molecular states. Now, to sum up, resolution at a true molecular scale can indeed be achieved. So these were the first experiments showing that this is possible in a very general way. The localization speed, if, you, if it comes down to localization, can be increased tenfold, a hundredfold, and this is just the beginning. I think it will be also a thousandfold and even more in the future because the conception speed and photon saving limits have, have not been reached. And as I said, approaching the molecule position iteratively, which I have not done in these measurements, we haven't done this here, um, uh, will lead to further uh, photon savings because the one over square root of n dependence um, is fundamentally outperformed. And so um, uh, this is a very effective way. And I think um, it's clearly one of the way of going. And of course, just calculating the centroid is, of course, not a central, central element of breaking diffraction barriers. One way, of getting, one way of getting the coordinate, but it's not the most fast and photon efficient one. So this is something. So it's important to remember. Applications can be done in many ways. Um, imaging, of course, applying high resolution to all kinds of, of, um, of areas. But I can imagine complementing FRET, first, first uh, resonance energy transfer, uh, application structure biology, like protein folding, and so on, and, and many others. And with that, I'm acknowledging the people who have actually worked in the lab getting these data very talented PhD students, Klaus Bosch and Ivan Eilers, and Francisco Balzarotti, a postdoc um, who worked in my lab for a couple of years um, and did a fantastic job. And with that, I'm thanking them and thank you for your attention. <laughs>